can produce methane. Now, it doesn't have to be at very high temperature. Temperatures like the body temperature to the temperature of the boiling point of water is sufficient. The microbes utilize hydrogen and carbon dioxide to produce methane in the metabolic process and use water as the solvent or the medium. Now, in either case, uh, whether it's geology or biology, once methane is injected into the atmosphere, the winds are going to spread it uniformly in a matter of a few weeks to a few months. But you're not finding that. So it means that something is destroying methane quite rapidly. And in fact, your amounts of methane also uh, are, are a function of how rapidly it gets destroyed, not just how fast it's getting produced. So it's a net between the two. So there are many different ways we can destroy methane. There are conventional ways in which photochemistry destroys methane. And that gives a very long lifetime, on the order of about 300 to 600 years. Uh, by way of comparison, methane lasts for about 10 years in the Earth's atmosphere if we cut off the source. Um, <clears throat> now, the other possibility is that there are powerful oxidants on Mars. And if that's the case, then methane can be destroyed much more rapidly than conventional methods. So let's roll the video, and we'll talk about this some more. So, what you're seeing in this video is that photolysis of methane by the UV photons occurs somewhere between 50 to 60 kilometers. It's occurring throughout the atmosphere, but largely above 50, 60 kilometers. And oxygen atoms uh, break down methane lower in the atmosphere. Now, these two processes combined give a long lifetime. On the other hand, in the dust devils and dust storms, you can induce electrochemistry, which in turn produce powerful oxidants like hydrogen peroxide which would destroy methane much more rapidly. Now, there's another type of oxidant that's in the form of perchlorates that was seen by the Phoenix uh, lander in the polar latitudes. We're not absolutely sure whether this kind of uh, oxidizer would be present at other latitudes. Uh, even if it is, uh, we, we need to keep it in mind, but it's not as powerful an oxidizer as hydrogen peroxide is. It's something to pursue. So the take-home message is that whether it's biology or it's geology, your observations seem to indicate that there are localized aquifers on Mars. And the short lifetime indicates the presence of powerful oxidants on Mars. With that, I will turn it over to Professor Lisa Pratt, who is going to say a lot more about biological source. Thank you, Sashil. Well, I think it's such an exciting discovery we're talking about today. And from the perspective of biology, it's, it's doubly important, first, because methane can be a waste product from microbes that, that are meth methane generating, but my methane can also be a food for microbes that are methane consumers. So in either way, this is, this is exciting because we have, we have evidence that we need to think about in terms of the possibilities of life on Mars. So let's start by thinking about where life might live on Mars if it, if it was there. And we have, a, we have a video here that we can roll now that talks about some, some interesting layering in the Martian subsurface, a photic zone near the top, a seasonal sublimation zone that would probably be dry most of the year, especially given the current harsh cold conditions on Mars. Underlying, underlying that, a, a permafrost zone in which you can see the fractures and voids here are filled with a white substance to indicate ice. And below that, a zone in which pore space, fractures, or voids could be filled with salt water. That would be a particularly attractive environment for deep subsurface life. It would be insulated on top by the permafrost, but heated from the bottom by the geothermal gradient of Mars. We know places like that on Earth. There are sub-permafrost brines in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And these are places where we're currently just starting to look for life and try to understand it on our own planet. And by analogy, think about what might be going on on Mars. One particular area that's been studied in detail are, are basins in which there is fracture-hosted deep subsurface groundwater. And we want to think about what forms of energy might be available in those deep subsurface environments to sustain life. The next video gives an example of an environment in which hydrogen is generated by the splitting of water molecules near to radioactive minerals. We see here a cartoon in which a, a, a simple swimming microbe can sense chemical gradients. It goes after hydrogen. It then reacts the hydrogen with carbon dioxide. 
and produces methane as a byproduct. That's the kind of microbial activity that would make sense in the deep subsurface of Mars as a way to generate the kinds of methane that we're talking about today. And I think given the lack of really compelling evidence for deep active fracturing and faulting to keep water rock reactions going, it's time, it's, it's prudent that we begin to explore Mars looking for the possibility of a life form that's exhaling methane. Well, thanks very much, Lisa. I, so let me recap and be clear that what we find here is measurements of methane. It's not evidence for life, but evidence of active processes. And uh, we know that it's in the, in the atmosphere, and we know that it varies with time. And that variability is what leads us to conclude that something must be happening in a very active Mars. What we don't know is whether or not these plumes of methane are biological or geological in origin. And also there's what we don't know we don't know, and so there can be another way to be surprised by this. And with that, I think I'll turn it over back to Duane. Well, thank you all. We're going to now open it up for questions. We're going to start here in Washington, go around our centers, and then we have uh, calls on our phone line, and we'll start here in the front with Mark. And please give your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Mark Kaufman with the Washington Post. Um, I was wondering if, if there's anything that you have detected that would, uh, that would suggest that, that the biological uh, source is not the likely source. In other words, uh, at this point, is, is there a weight of evidence on one side or another in terms of geological, chemical, or biological? I think I'll field that one. Uh, yes, uh, the answer is uh, simple. Uh, we can, in fact, uh, I'll answer the other side of that question first. Uh, we do not see certain gases that would be expected if the methane were produced by volcanoes, uh, particularly sulfur dioxide. It's been searched for, and it is not present at the expected level. If Mars ever evolved volcanism, then produce SO2 in the same abundance as one sees in terrestrial. Uh, relative to methane terrestrial volcanoes. So uh, that part of the uh, evidence does not support a volcanic origin. Uh, on the other hand, we cannot uh, say that there were gases that are expected uh, if it were biogenic in origin, but that we do not see. Uh, we have begun a detailed uh, survey uh, of trace gases on Mars. We actually began this in 2006 using the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea and NASA supported time. Uh, and in that case, we sampled up to 12 uh, potential biomarker gases, and, and along with carbon dioxide and water and HDO and searching for methane. Unfortunately, that season happens to be equinox on Mars, the season when we don't see methane anywhere. Actually, it's there, but it's a very low level, only about three parts per billion, and reduced by a factor of 15 or 20 from a peak uh, release that we showed you today. Uh, so we'll be uh, developing that uh, total search strategy further in the, in the coming campaign years, beginning in August with uh, an observatory in the Southern Hemisphere. So we'll be looking for those other molecules because our strategy is to uh, pursue both opportunities. And we want to understand what, what do we expect if biology is at work? Do we see that? And what do we expect if uh, serpentinization or volcanism is at work or another mechanism that we haven't thought of? Well, what would we expect then? Let's go test that and measure it. That's the scientific method, and that's how we'll make progress in understanding uh, what the origin of this methane ultimately it was or is, or if it had multiple origins. Okay, we'll come back here for any follow-ups. Let's go ahead and go to uh, one of our centers, the Johnson Space Center, I believe has a question and a follow-up. You are go, Johnson. Thank you. It's uh, Mark Carroll from the Houston Chronicle, and I wondered if you could uh, give us a little bit of history on